Hello and welcome to the Pop Council Podcast, the show where we cover everything in pop culture. Each week on this show, we discuss topics in the geek world as well as various fandoms such as Disney, Marvel, DC, Star Wars, theme parks, and everything in between. I'm Jamie Philbrook, Editor-in-Chief of Movie Phone, and welcome to another edition of the Pop Council Podcast. We have a great show for you today. We will be discussing Fantastic Four finding its director in WandaVision's Matt Shankman, WB Discovery shifting DC movie dates, John Hamm's Confess Fletch trailer, Disney Plus, and James Wan making a King Kong series, uh, Planet of the Apes, She-Hulk, and so much more. But it wouldn't be the Pop Council podcast without my co-host, Wendy Lee Zaney. Hi, Wendy. Hello, hello. How was the weekend? Pretty good. Pretty good weekend. Uh, my housekeeper finally came over. She hasn't been, she had COVID. Oh no. Uh, and wasn't able to come over for a while. So it's, I think it's Aww. been since like June. So this place got, you know, and I work here and yeah, it got oh, nasty. Yikes. So, yeah. yeah. So, so you're, you're so telling good. me Murphy's not picking up the slack by trying to clean and dust? Not, no, no. He'll lick a oh. few things that <laughs> drop in the kitchen, but that's about, that's about it. How about nice. you, Wendy? Now, unfortunately we know yeah, you, you've had you had a troubled weekend. Oh my gosh, I avoided it for two and a half years, and I finally contracted COVID. Luckily, today is the sixth day, and as you can hear, probably if you're listening, like podcast form, um, I'm I am a little congested, but I don't have actual nasal congestion. Um, there's occasional cough, but the worst, knock on wood, I think is behind me. But you know your typical symptoms: the fever, the aches, the what else? The coughing and just like the yeah. overall general of like the ick, you know, but so I just been sequestered to the apartment. Um, there's been a lot of Uber Eats. <laughs> oh, that's good. Because that's I also good. don't feel like cooking. So I've been just Netflixing a lot. I found on Uber Eats this weekend a pizza place in LA that puts green olives on their pizzas. And I, I've never had green olives as opposed to black olives. Green olives on pizza are very good. I was very excited. It's called. Um, I'm taking it's like, notes. It's like FK. They basically are trying to use the F word, like uh, F and best pizza. I okay. Forget it, it's like FK, F King best pizza. You know, you get what they're oh. trying to. You know, but it's like LA's effing best pizza. Okay. Um, yeah, so oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Green olives on pizza. I think I might have um, pizza for lunch. Wendy, it would not be Pop Council if we didn't have a third member uh, of the council here with us. And we're so excited to have James White from Empire back. James! Hey, hey guys. Hey, everybody. Hey, hey, it's great to be How back. How was your weekend? My weekend was, was pretty good. I didn't get pizza, which is bad, but I also didn't get COVID, which Yay! is good. So, <laughs> you know, yeah, it's a COVID pizza-less weekend. I column A, column B. It's all good. Yeah, yeah. Good, good, I, good. I, it was mostly, it was mostly uh, catching up with House of the Dragon. So, yeah. Oh, good. Yes, yeah. which I also, uh, Wendy and John talked about last week. I hadn't seen the premiere. I've now caught up with both episodes. Oh, good. So, yeah, yeah I yeah. Enjoy, uh, uh, enjoy seeing it as Sunday well. nights are back. <laughs> Sunday nights are back. Yeah. Um, but let's jump into a couple of things that happened uh, last week. And as we were ending uh, Friday and getting into the weekend, uh, a name was announced. I don't know quite how official official this is yet, but seems mm -hmm. pretty official that we will have a Fantastic Four director in Matt Shankman uh, from, uh, of course, WandaVision. Um, now, uh, a little more news, I think, kind of speeded out. That's not a word, but spit out over the weekend, uh, which is, of course, that Matt was also attached to Star Trek Four or the next Star Trek, whatever that would be. I think the thought was that it would include the Chris Pine cast. Mm. Uh, but uh, I think officially it's been said now that he is leaving that project so that he can do uh, Fantastic Four as, you know, I mean, listen, talk about good problems to have as a filmmaker. Do I do Fantastic Four or Star Trek? Like, what do I want to do? Honestly. And, yeah. and you, you know, I think, I mean, I, I would think it would go a little bit into your own personal preference, right? Like, I don't know how much Matt is a huge Marvel fan versus huge Star Trek fan. One would think he probably enjoys both. Uh, but 
you know, you, you, you can't, uh, you know, when, when Kevin uh, Feige and Marvel comes calling, you can't say no. And mm. Fantastic Four is certainly a great opportunity. Uh, and I'm worried that uh, I'm not sure mm. how quickly that Star Trek movie was moving over at Paramount. And we know that Fantastic Four is moving pretty quickly over mm -hmm. at, uh, at Marvel. So, um, you know, we know he does good with Marvel stuff. We've seen him in WandaVision. So um, I think this is a good choice uh, of Marvel directors. And they seem to have a lot of people sort of in their pipeline that they're working with. Obviously, we saw how they kind of groomed the Russo brothers to take over the end of the Avengers franchise. Um, Destin seems to be have the same going on with him. Uh, and I think uh, uh, Matt as well seems to be in the form of directors. I think Kat over at uh, She-Hulk might also be one that they look to as well as the guys from Miss Marvel as far, far mm -hmm. as directors, mm -hmm. you know, who have shown they can do good stuff in the Disney plus Marvel universe and let's give them a feature film. Uh, James, let's get you in here real quick. What are your thoughts on uh, Matt getting uh, this opportunity? Yeah, he feels like he could be a really good fit, I think. I mean, he's he's obviously shown the Marvel chops with WandaVision, which was really, really good, you know, really emotional, really fun, really interesting, did some different things, and also proved that he can, especially towards the end, but all the way through, frankly, he could handle the effect side of things, which is a good thing for a Marvel director to know about and to be able to do without making it feel it's all about the effects. And while I know people have sort of pointed to the fact that he hasn't, really done a lot of experience on the big screen his one movie credit at least as a director is this indie a24 movie called cut bank which was a few years ago but you know what he has this extensive resume when it comes to tv in particular he's done a game of thrones he's mm -hmm. done great he's done the boys he's done all sorts of things so the guy knows his way around shooting stuff he knows his way around effects he knows his way around characters I think I think he'll be really good. I hope he'll be really good. And like you were saying, Jamie, this is the this is you know um, Marvel essentially creating a pipeline and finding people from more of an indie world, from a other places world, to sort of bring into their their family of directors, their roster of directors, as it were. Like it worked out with the Russos, so why wouldn't they try and keep doing that? Because they've got people that know how to handle character stuff, can come on and be taught the stunts and the effects and everything like that. And Chapman's already got a good good sort of lay up on that front anyway. So yeah, I, I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful. I want the Fantastic Four movie to be really great. And I think if John Watts isn't going to do it, you know, I, he's busy. You know, he was other stuff. He's got Star Wars on. He's got all sorts of other stuff he's doing. Yeah, I, I think Chapman could be a really good fit. Well, it's interesting, you know, I, I was watching something over the weekend uh, about sort of the history of the Fantastic Four and movies, and uh, we won't go through it. We all we, we kind of all know it, I think. But mm -hmm. after the Roger Corman, you know, the idea that the um, barbershop director would be given the keys to the Fantastic Four franchise seems a little strange now looking back on it, but that's what happened. And so uh, hearing you, James, say, well, we're giving the keys to the guy who did WandaVision. Yeah, that's mm. not so far stretched. That that mm -hmm. seems like that's a good idea to me. Uh, Wendy, how do you like this news? It's interesting. We've talked a lot about speculation in our own theories when it comes to who will be directing Fantastic Four, who is going to be the cast. Uh, and I, you know... Matt's name's never really been on our list, but I like it. I like what he did with WandaVision. WandaVision is still, to this day, we've had so many Disney Plus shows since the debut of that show and remains to be still one of my favorite when it comes to it. So I think, you know, with Marvel, Kevin Feige speaking, um, he tends to continue to like give work to the directors that he's, worked with in the past especially tv and i do think that he for matt probably understands that marvel formula um and again he's kind of like the both of you said it so eloquently already that he's no stranger to special effects cgi and things like that and you need you need a director who is able to visualize that and knows how to direct around that so um I am excited to hear that we finally have landed a director and to see where things go from here. I still was in the back of my mind was hoping for John Krasinski, but 
that is okay. I welcome this with open arms. And let's just see what, you know, let's make a really good Fantastic Four movie so we can just move forward with whatever cast they will give us. Uh, and then, like, let's not, like, reboot, 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 reboot. Because we all remember how many Fantastic Fours are there? There's, like, two total? Right? There have been... Uh, There's the Jessica I mean, Elba. If you, if you count the Roger Corman, there have been four. Uh, there's been, yeah, see? So there was the Roger Corman, there were two Jessica Albas, mm -hmm. and then the, the, the one with uh, Miles Teller. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I'm glad you also mentioned uh, John Kras Krasinski, and I feel like we're at the point now where we have to let that go. Um, Just let it go. <laughs> not, you know, and I appreciate them giving us a tease, giving us a little something in Doctor Strange, uh, Multiverse of Madness. Um, that's all you're going to get. Emily Blunt doesn't want to play a superhero. She said so on Howard Stern. Maybe in, there's enough money to change her mind. But, <laughs> uh, and I don't think at this point Krasinski would have done the cameo if he was planning on making the Fantastic Four movie. Um, mm, so mm -hmm. I think, I think that that, and, and, and listen, I don't think we should be disappointed with not having Krasinski. I think Sh uh, Shakeman is going to be, you know, like we both all have said, I think he's going to do some interesting stuff. And now it just comes down to who the cast is going to be. And I, I hope that they, uh, I, I get why they want to go probably young with the cast, but I, I hope they find some sort of, happy middle where maybe yeah. maybe mr you know mr fantastic so you know in his 30s and you know maybe we're a little older johnny could maybe be in his 20s you know um but you know it wouldn't be terrible if ben Grimm was in his 40s you know i i think we i'd like to see something where it's just not like um that last one where it was just like all 20 year old kids <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah yep agreed yeah. Agreed. We agree all around. Well, good enough. Let's move on to uh, let's go see what the other guys are doing over at DC. And uh, yeah, more interesting news. I don't want to say trouble, but more mm. news for the new Warner Brothers Discovery uh, team with their DC movies. Um, so the announcement is, in fact, that. OK. Shazam 2 is not opening in 2023 opposite Avatar. I don't know why any of us thought that was ever going <laughs> um, So it is moving out of December 2023 into the March, sorry, December 2022 into the March 2023 uh, spot where Aquaman 2 was going to be. And now Aquaman 2 will open at Christmas of 2023. Um I actually think the Aquaman pushing makes sense. Mm. Uh, well, they mm. both make sense, actually, because originally Aquaman was going to go against Avatar, and I just didn't think that was a great idea. Um, and then they decided to push to put Shazam in that spot, which is an even worse idea, because Shazam would just get destroyed by Avatar. Yeah. Um, and so I think moving Shazam to March makes a lot more sense. And then... You, you know, it's going to take another year for the next Avatar to come out. So you can kind of, and there's not a Star Wars movie moving into Christmas 2023. Mm -hmm. So Aquaman is actually probably a great position in Christmas of 2023. And it gives them a little bit more time to figure out what they're doing with the Michael Keaton, Bat Ben Affleck, Batman cameos mm -hmm. and that kind of stuff. So Wendy, what are your thoughts on this shifting is it a good thing? Is it is it more concerns that we should be having with the brain trust over at uh, WBD with their DC stuff? I mean, I feel like every time you know we see a merger of a company, new CEO stepping in, there's bound to be things that get moved around, and new plans that you know uh, gets put in action. And I think we're kind of still seeing that here, uh, even after all the other statements as Aslov have uh, talked about and all the cancellations. But I honestly am kind of surprised. I shouldn't be in this day and age for movie release dates to get shifted. But it does surprise me because he was so confidently saying like these movies are going to go forward. And they obviously are still going forward. It's just going to be later. So I, it, it just makes me wonder like what exactly is it about these films that were, it's being pushed back so far. The move away from Avatar 
I understand. And like, you know, for people who may say, oh, no one's interested in an Avatar sequel because it's been so long. You'd be surprised if you read some of the comments mm -hmm. on the trailer. And, and there's a lot of people who are looking to go back into that world. So like I, as a company also wouldn't want to go up against, you know, a giant, <laughs> like the sequel to Avatar. But I feel like the further back they push these movies, the longer, and maybe that is the purpose now that I'm talking about it like this, th that they're trying to build their DCEU. They're, they're, trying to leave, they're trying to finally solidify like what direction they want to go with the DCEU. Uh, and so maybe that is a part of it. But I think for me as a, as a fan, like for Shazam, the sequel, like I really enjoyed the first one. I've been very curious to see the second one. So it's, I feel like it's already coming out kind of late and now it's pushed back even a little bit further. Aquaman, I kind of do understand as well. So, uh, but at the very least they're, I guess they're not pushing back Black Adam. So that's a good thing. Right. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's an interesting, but not, I guess, the more I think about it, not really that surprising of a move. Yeah, I mean, I'm glad you mentioned the stuff about Avatar. I, uh, it, it's such a funny thing because, you know, personally for me, I'm like, I don't really care anymore. <laughs> but I, when the trailer came out, like fans were going nuts. And, and especially after Titanic and then 10 years later, Avatar, you can never bet against James Cameron. Like we've learned, you, we should have learned by now not to bet against them. So whether Avatar ends up doing what, we think it could do or not. Um, I think that the studios are correct in moving. And I really think with these two in particular, Wendy, it's not, we're not talking about, you know, the fear of the DC overall plan or I think, I really think these are really have to do with Avatar mm -hmm. um, and, and not, you know, Flash, that's a different story, obviously. Okay. And we've talked at nauseum yes. about that on the show, but these two, I think are, are, you know, they're ready to go and it's different. I think it's just about finding the best time to release them. Yes. Um, and I agree with you, you know, I believe originally we were going to get all three of these DC movies this year. Wow. And we were supposed to get flash this year for sure. And, and maybe Shazam was in early 2023. I think it was in early 2023 and then moved up and then moved. And now we're moving it back, but we were originally going to certainly get Aquaman and flash this year. So, you know, a lot of moving, a lot of pushing around, but hopefully when these movies do come out, it will be the right time for them. And yes. we will enjoy them. James, what are your thoughts on the, shifting dc dates yeah well the the aquaman stuff whether or not this is 100 percent certain it could be an excuse they're using because of how everything's shaping up but they did talk about aquaman needing more time for its vfx to be finished because of the whole backlog of vfx houses being absolutely inundated with all these right. big movies that got delayed during covid and then everything's needing to come out needing to come out needing to be finished needing to be done so yeah there's definitely there's definitely a feeling of that also um, I, I sort of th was thinking about, you know, you've got Avatar, which is probably an 800 pound gorilla. Like you were saying, Jamie, you know, let's not count out James Cameron. He always seems to deliver somehow. Uh, and also you have Black Panther Wakanda Forever coming out around the same time. So Shazam was looking at facing up these two gigantic, much anticipated sequels. Whereas, you know, I love Shazam. Don't get me wrong. Shazam is fantastic and really good fun. I'm not sure it has quite the same pop cultural power as, say, an Avatar 2 or a Black Panther 2. So I think that's a good thing. I think David F. Sandberg, the director, is kind of breathing a sigh of relief that he's getting in this slightly easier slot. I think people will be happy to wait for it. I think it'll be worth the wait. I'm, I'm really hopeful for it, given how the first one was so much fun. The other stuff that kind of gets to me about the DC moves is part of that announcement was then was not, maybe not an announcement, but the trades reporting that House Party reboot and the new Evil Dead movie are being upgraded from HBO Max releases to theatrical releases, which makes me feel even worse for Team Batgirl because I feel like okay, mm -hmm. I'm sure both those movies are probably going to be great. I, mm -hmm. you know, I, I want I want to believe that they're actually really really good and they're worth the upgrade from from streaming to theatrical, but. It still makes me think like what could have been with Batgirl and what is going on there. That seems like a really strange thing to do. Move these two up 
whereas their big thing was like oh we're only going to release them if we're going to we're going to do if it makes sense to move them to theatrical Batgirl wasn't wasn't really going to work as theatrical and, like, and the evil dead movie is but, <laughs> you know it could be wonderful it could be wonderful i i don't know and the other little tiny thing that happened was the batman the cape crusader new animated series which had jj abrams producing has bruce tim you know aboard to sort of run the thing and and ed rubeck and people like that i'm thinking like oh my goodness you're gonna get you're gonna shelve that that sounds like a real sort of crazy decision and now obviously they've interestingly opened it up so that warner brothers tv can go and shop it around places so you know that apple and netflix and everyone is going to be like we can get batman i mean hell disney might even look to be and be like hey we own marvel now we're gonna own this bit of dc (laughs) i don't know we'll see we'll see but it just seems like a lot of craziness around right now Mm. Yeah, that's interesting. And I'm glad you brought up Batgirl, too. And we'll just mention that there were stories that there had sort of a uh, sort of a funeral per, 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 uh, uh, kind of um, screening of mm-hmm. uh, Batgirl uh, on the Warner Brothers lot this past weekend for right. uh, mostly just, I think, uh, people who work at Warner Brothers and, and the filmmakers and the cast to see it. So. I don't know. I I, I agree That's with you. That's so James. weird to me. Yeah, I that agree, with you, James. It's and and we've heard that the filmmakers don't even have any of the footage. Unlike uh, Zach it was Snyder. like gone. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it was all off the server. So I don't know. Hopefully, I I think you bring up some good points, James, about you know Evil Dead and a few of those other House Party, um, HBO Max films. I I think we also know that Blue Beetle is officially going to be theatrical Mm -hmm. so i don't know i feel like there's more to the batgirl story than we really heard um because it seems like there's more to that story now uh Mm -hmm. as far Mm -hmm. as you know they could have done i can't believe that they can't do anything with it um but you know maybe just chalk that up to uh to the taxes and is there like a loophole like it expires after well, no, my understanding maybe. is if they want the tax exemption for yeah. it, like they have to shelf it. And I actually even read something wow. where part of the tax exemption deals with the idea of like, what if it ever does come out? So there mm. would be less money up front. Oh, wow. And so what they might do, and again, take this with a grain of salt. I don't recall if I read this in the article as like a possibility or more mm. like a long shot, but there is a possibility that if they actually incinerate the product, Mm -hmm. like Mm -hmm. put all of it in a fire Mm -hmm. that like literally burn it, Mm -hmm. that they, you know, and prove that to the, to the, you know, to the IRS, then they can get everything up front. Wow. And so I don't know if I'm saying that exactly right, but that there was some incentive to possibly, actually physically destroy the product right so wow. that they could get the wow. tax. but and you know i don't know i mean is it worth that much i mean the to you know to destroy that i i don't know i i can't imagine that they could make some money some other way especially now everyone wants to see it yeah right yeah. absolutely so yeah i don't I, know who yeah. are we to question the business practices of uh, major corporations? But in a little bit of good news, let's talk about a trailer. Again, adding to movies that have been in the works for decades. Uh, you can see John Hamm here as Erwin M. Fletcher, uh, the character played by Chevy Chase in the uh, classic 80s uh comedy detective movie fletch uh the film that film uh was based on books by uh this this author i'm blanking on his first name mcdonald maybe james gregory mcdonald gregory mcdonald thank you gregory mcdonald uh novels um and in fact this one is called confess fletch it's based on one of mcdonald's novels uh and promises to be a little bit more like the um the novels like the books uh then the film which became really just a chevy chase comedy uh Mm -hmm. which we loved but uh this will have the comedy 
uh, from the novels, but with a little bit more seriousness. Um, also interesting that this project has been in the works forever. Kevin Smith at one time was going to do it with Jason Lee and then Ben Affleck. Mm -hmm. Zach, uh, Zach Braff got it at one point after Garden State and was going to start it himself. Uh, and then John Hamm has uh, gotten it now. And uh, the trailer is out. The film comes out in September. Um, as a longtime Fletch fan, I'm really excited for this. I thought the trailer hit the right uh, tone of what this should be. Um, John Hamm is obviously a very good actor and also... Mm -hmm a handsome, handsome man, perhaps maybe a little too handsome for Fletch. Uh, but um, that was also part of Fletch in the, in the books. You know, he was good with the, you know, he could get a date and he was good with women and, you know, a little bit like that. So I think it works for him. And I think that John Hamm is such, obviously not, you know, on the comedy level of a Chevy Chase, but is so funny as, a terribly handsome actor. Uh, I think he may be the funniest terribly handsome actor we have. <laughs> and uh, I, I think he could really pull this off. So I think it's worth the wait. But James, let's go to you. What were your thoughts on uh, this trailer and the and the idea of a Chevy Chaseless Fletch? Yeah, I was. I, I feel like I've been writing about this movie for almost all my entire career, like, you know, yes. or so now. And I feel like, you know, every time one person comes up, one person might be Fletch, one person's directing all this. And like you were saying, Kevin Smith, Zach Braff, Ben Affleck, all sorts of people. Um, I, I mean, I, I, I'm interested to see this one. It's, it's Greg Matola who did super bad and has done other stuff. And he's a, you know, a funny, good director of this sort of stuff. And, and yeah, I, I think Ham's a good pick. Honestly, I, I, I've loved him on various things that he's done where he's shown his comedy side. He can undercut the handsomeness with goofiness. You know, hell, he's on a series of progressive ads right now being, playing right. himself in a in a sort of a silly way slightly so yeah um i'm interested to see it. i mean i do like the chevy chase movies but as you were saying the chevy chase movies aren't completely fletch from the books because it's a lot of chevy chase sort of screwball disguise a lot of the disguise stuff some of this stuff like catchphrasey stuff wasn't necessarily part of fletch all the time in the books so this is almost going more back to the books but also at the same time updating it because it's set now as opposed to the the chase movies which are in the 80s so it's sort of further away from the time scale of the mcdonald books but in the same way maybe hewing back a little bit closer to the books themselves so i'm yeah i'm, I'm really excited to see it i i hope it's going to be really great i feel a little bit worried that it's kind of it kind of feels like it might pop up in cinemas in theaters for like 10 seconds and then it's going straight to what is it? it's going straight to digital is it digital day and date with theaters and then also it's showtime after a month or something like that it's doing that mm. kind of deal so right. i kind of worry that it's does it sound like maybe it's being sort of quietly released let go as it were more than like released with big fanfare if, it, if they really believed in it they'd be like my goodness it's fletch it's back you're gonna watch it and now it's like hey here's fletch john ham's in it that's good so <laughs> I think that's I, I fair to great. say. Yeah, I hope it's I really think... good. You know, I, I want it to be great. I want it to be funny. I want it to be mystery. I want it to be quirky. Yeah, I, I hope it's everything we're hoping for, really. So yeah, yeah. I think that's safe to say, uh, James. Uh, Miramax is releasing it, and mm -hmm. so I don't know how much. I mean, my guess is that Ham is going to go on talk shows and promote it as much as he can. But will this yeah. be it? you know, a big, a big release, probably not. Um, yeah. And I also want to mention that uh, the actor Richard Libertini, who played uh, Fletch's boss, uh, his editor at the newspaper in mm. the uh, Chevy Chase movies is being played by John Slattery in this one. <laughs> so yeah. there is a little Mad Men reunion. A little there. reunion. <laughs> yeah. uh, when did, you, did you watch Fletch when you were a kid? Do you re have any kind of recall to that and, and, what are your thoughts on uh, sort of a reboot of the material with John Hamm? I learned about Fletch when you put this on the uh, uh, the rundown. <laughs> and uh, I was like, oh, what's this? So I had no idea that it was a book. I had no idea it was, you know, a film previously. Um, but I do love John Hamm. And I think, Jamie, you said it. Like, how is somebody so handsome? Yeah. 
Like it's just it's just hard to not want to watch him in things because one he's excellent and two he looks great on screen. Uh, so I mean, the, like tonally, I think this fits and I think he fits the role. Yes. If you've seen any of the John Hamm stuff, like he can do the serious stuff, but he can do kind of I don't want to call this slapstick comedy because I don't think it is, but it's it gives me like a little at times, you know, tongue in cheek, you know, especially this like. Somehow he stumbled his way into this murder and all of a sudden he's a suspect and, and he's still like, no, 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 I got this. And it's just it's just going to be really interesting to to watch. And I do agree. I, I, I do worry about a film like this not getting um, a big uh, like ticket sale for the box office. I hope so, um, just because I love movies and I want people to see all the all the movies, but I, I am not sure. I mean, I think there's a specific audience for this, especially those who have seen the Chevy Chase version of the film. But um, maybe the younger audience would, it would have to be like word of mouth, you know, once the film comes out, once the critics have reviewed it um, and people will go, oh, okay, well, that's something I want to, you know, do on a Friday night. Yeah, the Fletch part of it i think isn't going to really attract anyone under 40 so um i agree with you i i maybe this would have been better as a netflix movie um ah. you know that which they did with the spencer uh you know they did a spencer movie for netflix with mark Wahlberg based on the spencer spencer for hire robert yurick mm -hmm. series but that was a, a a bunch of famous uh detective novels as well so um the other interesting thing if my memory serves me and it's been at least 10 years since i read confess fat fletch i remember it being a prequel with a younger fletch nope. like he wasn't quite an established fletch yet so but this feels like they're using sort of mid-career fletch uh, and certainly john ham can't play a younger, you know what I mean? He, he is the age yeah. John Hamm is. So uh, I feel like they're kind of taking the source material and then just sort of, you know, placing Fletch at sort of, a, a um, you know, the, the appropriate John Hamm age so that he could play the character. Yeah. But uh, yeah, it's going to be interesting to see. I'm looking forward to it. Um, and I do think that they hit the right tone, as mm -hmm. you mentioned, Wendy, in the, in the trailer. Um, not so much slapsticky, but it's sort of, you know, fish out of water and yes. you know, uh, comedy. But that is, that's very Fletch. That's yeah. very Fletch <laughs> to say, uh, oh, oh, you think I'm the murderer, but I can help you find the real murderer. So, yeah, that, that, that works. Um, <laughs> well, we had a couple. Uh, let, let, let's move back over to Disney and Disney Plus. There was an announcement this week, sort of surprising to me because I thought, Warner Brothers had the rights to King Kong uh, that Disney Plus is working on with James Wan, a King Kong series. Um, now, I'm going to pass this over to James because I know he's been writing about this. And maybe, James, you can explain to us how the rights work. Like, how does that work that Disney can do a uh, King Kong series? Yeah, so how it really works is everyone who wants to make a King Kong series or movie goes to a zoo. And there's a gorilla, there. the gorilla. The gorilla has had legal training, and yes. the gorilla's basically like, if he throws poo at you, you're allowed to make a King Kong series. So, I mean, it's a difficult decision. You have to pick which executive gets poo thrown. Anyway, no. Apparently, here's here's how it really works. And the most interesting thing I learned in sort of researching some of the stories I've written about this is that if you'll notice the Warner Brothers discover, I'm not going to keep calling it that, just the Warner Brothers legendary movie. <laughs> um, they, the MonsterVerse movies, uh, such as they're called, you'll only ever see them called Kong versus or something Kong. Yeah, they're called mm. Kong. They're never called King Kong because apparently they don't have the rights to use King Kong. Now, Universal quite where that comes right from, I'm not sure. But okay. I know that there are lots of different rights sort of that you can get to try and use Kong because right now we have the MonsterVerse movies. Don't mm -hmm. forget we also have Apple TV making their Titan series, which will also mm. feature a sort of probably a Kong thing. That might be more Godzilla focused, but you never know. He might pop in for two minutes for like a cameo at the wacky neighbor, like like a Kramer. 
great King Kramer. But anyway, and then you have Netflix making a Skull Island anime. So that's another thing of its own accord. And then you now you have this. Apparently what Disney Plus and James Wan are using are rights to Marion C. Cooper's original books and a series of novelizations. He says, looking at these notes here, a series of novelizations uh, by a guy called Joe DeVito. So they can use those rights. They can use a lot of Skull Island stuff. They can make it, apparently it's going to be more of a, a bit like Skull Island the movie. It's going to be more of a prequel, but again, set in the modern day. So I'm not sure how that works because Skull Island was obviously set in the 70s. Um, so it might flash back to like a really early time of Kong and like pre, like Kongs of before the ones that we know now and everything like that, but also be set in the modern day, exploring that. And we do know that Stephanie Folsom, who wrote sort of who created and adapted paper girls for amazon is is doing the is writing the script this time so yeah it's 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 an interesting time to be a kong fan it feels like everybody has a kong project now he forget superheroes everyone wants to be in the kong business <laughs> I have so, to know, say, I mean, i'm not a huge yeah. monster you know verse person mm -hmm. but i've always cared about kong more than godzilla i do mm -hmm. not that interested in Godzilla and of the uni the recent Universal monster movies, I have to say Skull Island was my favorite, mm. but uh, uh, without a doubt, uh, I loved it much more than the uh, two Godzilla films or the Godzilla vs Kong. So, um, does Disney have the right to King? I, I, as far as I'm aware, I think it's called King Kong. Yeah, I yeah. think oh. that's that's you know it's a, an so early just stage Universal that can't oh. use the King. Yeah, as far as I'm aware, if it's Warner Brothers, it's, yeah, Warner Brothers or Universal, whoever has the, it's, 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 I think that's still at Warner Brothers, the legendary MonsterVerse yeah. stuff is still, mm, and right. they can use Kong versus or Kong or whatever, oh, Kong's right. Island, you notice they're all called just Kong something, they're not, they're not King Kong, so. Right, yeah, Warner Brothers, think. Warner Brothers can't use King, but Disney They can't can. use King, whereas I think Universal, because obviously Peter Jackson, they had King Kong. Oh, that's right, so, that's right, yeah. right, 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 so right. They okay. can use King Kong if they wanted it. They may now jump in maybe with the Peacock series or with a series of movies like, here's King Kong now. And I don't know, I think we could reach a Kong saturation phase. At one point. <laughs> too much, too much ape. Going in way too much, but yeah, you know, monkey business, but even though he's not a monkey, I know. Well, and it felt like there was when the Peter Jackson film came out, right? It felt mm. like that sort of was the culmination of like the King Kong fandom at that point. Because even yeah. when they were trying to bring him back to fight Godzilla in these movies, I feel like that was more of the harder, for whatever reason, I don't know why. Again, I love Kong, but mm. Kong was the harder sell of the Kong Godzilla stuff. Mm. Wendy, what are your thoughts on a, on a James Wan Disney Plus Kong series? Well, I'm glad James White just explained yes. to us about the the rights, and because I was very confused, and I was like, so the the re the initial reaction was, oh, cool, a King Kong series, Disney Plus. Hold on, uh, and then my brain kind of, you know, did a somersault. I was like, what didn't? Wait, so is it public domain? So I'm glad that James is here to give us a better explanation about the rights and who and what is using it in a certain way. Um, that's that's interesting that Disney Plus just all of a sudden was like, yeah, we're doing a live action King Kong series with James Wan. Mm -hmm. um, I do like James Wan and the way he shoots and the way he, he directs, uh, specifically his horror. So I don't know how much like elements of horror is going to be added to be added into King Kong. But I for a while, now that we're like so into the digital age and everything streaming and things like that and especially with all these Disney Plus shows from all Marvel and Star Wars I do embrace the fact that they're going to be doing it as a series because sometimes and I love movies and I love seeing things play out on on big screen and I live for that kind of entertainment but also for you know a more complete story where they can take the time to develop the characters and the settings a series for King Kong may be the way to go. And we don't have anything like this currently on Disney plus. So like, why not? I think is kind of the whole thing for me is, is why not? And could they also expand this into a movie? And like, James, is that allowed? If, if King Kong, they do a series on Disney plus, and then they want to like bring that to the big screen. That's is a that very good question. I actually don't know about that. They might 
be able to. That might clash with Universal's movie that, rights. Yeah. That, that I haven't heard much about, but that's a really good question, Wendy. I, I wish I had a great answer for you. I'm going to go back to the lawyer gorilla throwing food. <laughs> go to the zoo and find out for us. This, in this context, like, okay, the Flash TV series was a huge hit, mm. but they can't just do a Flash TV series movie. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because Flash Warner Flash. Brothers owns the right. So I think Ooh. it would sort of fall into that right. Like they can uh -huh. do a King Kong series, mm -hmm. but yeah, I think that's, I don't that's know that they can do a movie based on is, that TV series. Yeah, Flash is more WBWB. Flash, Flash mm. is a different situation just because they tried to keep the TV stuff separate from the movie stuff. But you saw, right. you saw Ezra Miller show up on on the w, on the CW show. For ten seconds for a cameo, but yeah, that's it's, it's, but, but, but we, yeah, but, but that's but, but but yeah, making I like what I'm saying is that is they may have the rights to make a TV version out of this, but I don't know that they have the film. I'm sure they have the movie rights. Then adapt that movie, so. TV show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so it's interesting. And then the other thing I'll just say uh, about that is um, I think one of the reasons I love Skull Island, Kong Skull Island, over the other. Godzilla and Godzilla Kong movies that we've seen in recent years is because, you know, it's really hard to craft good human characters that you care about in mm -hmm. these films. And yeah. you have to have them because you can't just care about Godzilla or Kong. Like there's gotta be these other characters and they almost never work. I didn't mm -hmm. think that Alexander Skarsgar and those characters really worked in the Kong uh, versus Godzilla thing. I didn't think, you know, wasn't it Elizabeth Olsen and Aaron Taylor Johnson oh, and Brian Cranston, yeah. the first Godzilla? That I didn't, mm -hmm. They didn't do anything for me in that one. But the human characters in Skull Island, mm -hmm. Sam Jackson and Tom Hiddleston and John Goodman and Brie uh, Larson and, mm -hmm. and you know Shea Winningham and all the other supporting, I yeah. loved every one of those characters. I got right behind. I, John C. Riley was a little ridiculous, but everyone else I got right behind. And so for me, that's the most important thing in building this Kong series. Yeah, I need to love King Kong and you need to do mm -hmm. some cool stuff with King Kong, but you need to make human characters that I care about, yeah. that I want to follow, especially in a series. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, we can, we yeah. can wave away Alex, Alexander Skarsgård for two hours, but we need, if it's going to be a continuing series that I watch week after week, Mm -hmm. I need that Tom Hiddleston from Skull Island, that Brie Larson, those characters that I care about that I want to see more of, not yeah. just the ape. Um, yeah. That's my thought. Uh, well, staying in the ape family, <laughs> actor Owen Teague, uh, this is a shot here from him uh, in The Stand. Uh, the I guess it started as a CBS Access series and became Paramount Plus uh, based on Stephen King. But he has been uh, cast as the lead in the new, whatever the new uh, Planet of the Apes series is moving forward uh, at uh, 20th Century and um, Disney. Mm -hmm. So um, I actually didn't really know a lot about this actor. I hadn't really seen him. Uh, I hadn't seen The Stand, so I didn't really know much of his work. Um, it was sort of a name that came out of the blue. Uh, I would have thought maybe an Austin Butler or someone, you know, um, Tom Blythe, right? Who's in the, mm -hmm. you know, kind, kind of, you know. Um, Hunger Games thing. Yeah, yeah. 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 Hunger mm -hmm. Games and coming off Ability to Kid kind of. But I, I thought I'd see maybe a name we were a little bit more familiar with than this one. So mm -hmm. that is surprising to me. Also surprising. I guess not surprising that Disney would want now that they own the Planet of the Apes, they need to move forward with another another trilogy, I guess. Um, and, but what will this be? Will it be tied to the Andy Circus series? Will it somehow be tied to the uh, the original Charles and Heston series? God forbid it's tied to the Tim Burton film. What do <laughs> oh. we think? Um, by the way, can I just say, I actually, I will defend the Tim Burton Planet of the Apes. I actually really like the Tim Burton and Planet of the Apes because if you watch it, it is really just a remake of Sam Raimi's Army of Darkness. Uh -huh. watch, watch it again. It is almost a shot for shot remake of Army of Darkness, even with the director's cut uh, ending, uh, it, which could be considered similar to the... Um, 
the a Abraham Lincoln ending. Uh, anyways, uh, Wendy, what are your thoughts on this next chapter of Planet of the Apes? What can we expect? I mean, not surprised at all that they are quickly putting another Planet of the Apes into action. Uh, I am actually pleasantly surprised to have uh, Owen Teague in the in the lead. I quite liked his performance. So uh, in, in uh, you know, all the various films that, and, and projects that he's done. So I, I like that. I like seeing young, fresh faces uh, on big projects that, you know, you know, I don't know how many people saw The Stand, but like really enjoyed him in that. Uh, he was also in the It film, I think, as right. one of the, the, the bullies. Yep. Um, but Planet of the Apes. Um, I, yeah, I'm curious. Because you you said it right before asking me the question, is it going to be tied to the Andy Circus one? I would like to think so, right? It doesn't make sense for them to want to do another reboot and like retell the story or, or something like that. I feel like it would like why go backwards when we can either or maybe a, maybe a brand new tale or something like that. I don't know. That's that is like I'm not surprised, but I'm curious on where they can take the story that like, where can they go that they haven't taken to telling already? Yeah. I, I like the idea. I don't, I'm a with you, Wendy. I don't think we need another total reboot because yeah. that's essentially what the Andy circus films were, was a kind of a total reboot. So mm -hmm. I think something that either moves forward in that timeline and listen, I, you know, I mean, spoiler alert, Caesar's gone, so mm -hmm. it wouldn't, you know what I mean? Like, there could be, and there were always hints that the Char that the Andy Circus series could lead into the Charlotte Heston series, right? Mm -hmm. There were always hints that they weren't completely separate. Mm -hmm. So I like that. I also like the idea, Wendy, that you had of sort of just doing something completely new. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it doesn't, not every movie has to set up a trilogy and a reboot. And you know what I mean? You could just make a nice Planet of the Apes movie that takes place in that, you know, world. So um, I'm open to both, but a full on reboot. Mm. I don't know that I have the energy to sit through the next 15 years of those movies again. Can I just point out something yeah. really quick in this deadline article? And thank you to MK for pointing it out that he's been tapped to play the lead primate. Oh, so it's going to be, he's going to, yeah, mocap it. Okay. A la Andy Circus. Well, that actually makes a lot more sense now for casting. Yeah. Because he wasn't a big name. So that actually makes more sense that he's playing one of the, the apes. Um, Caesar's son, maybe. James, what do you think? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think. I mean, this is this is this is what this is. Wes Ball, who did the Maze Runner movies, who yeah. this sort of concept to the studio and wants to. I think he's looking to make more of a, a trilogy type thing. And honestly, I think it is going to be the next sort of chapter of the of the Caesar story of, of Caesar's family. Or oh, that's exciting. People, maybe it jumps forward like another hundred years, and we see well, how yeah. the if if the planet like the ape civilization has started to like really grow into what they're going to become in the Charlton Heston movies. So, I'd be interested to watch that kind of thing. You know, somewhere in between the two. You know, the like the ape civilization really. We saw the, sort of the real the birth of it in in the three three movies. The the one by uh, what was the, the original guy? I'm trying to remember the poor original guy's name. Was it Rupert Wyatt? Rupert Wyatt was the original Rupert one, Wyatt, and then yep. the two Matt Reeves movies. So we saw the very sort of like early birth pangs of the ape civilization, and now maybe we jump forward a little bit and. We, we see how they sort of start to do their own thing. Uh, there will be apparently still human survivors around. So we'll we'll see some humans, they'll cast some humans and, and do that. I mean, not that they're casting apes, but you know what I mean. <laughs> um, and then, or maybe that gorilla who's the lawyer can get a role. We'll see, he's got a good, but he's got a very tight contract. I'll say this. Um, anyway, so I'm interested to see what it is. They've been very, very tight lipped about it. They haven't released any details of what the story would be, but my guess would be yes, let's continue on the story that Matt Reeves really sort of got going with, with, with his movies and then just jump to the next sort of generation, as it were, a little bit. I can really see that working really well because it's not a reboot. It feels of a piece, but it's a, a new director having a new direction in his own way to sort of tell his story, but one that has ties to 
what they've been doing. So yeah, I I, I don't know. I really want to. I really again. I really hope it's great. I want to see it. You know, I love that. I love Dawn of the Planet of the Apes. I love. I love all. I like all the three Planet of the Apes movies they did recently. So yeah, I'm 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 really hopeful for this one. We'll see. It could be great. Thank yeah, you. absolutely. You got you got me excited for it. Now. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. I, I, I that 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 sounds good. We'll, we'll see. Uh, well, last thing we'll uh, talk about before we head out for the day is uh, another episode dropped this past week of She Hulk Attorney at Law, uh, which uh, I'm loving. And hopefully, you are too. Uh, but what I we loved this week was the return of Tim Roth as Emil Blonsky, the Abomination. Uh, this is his first appearance in the MCU since The Incredible Hulk, which has unfortunately become sort of the bastard child of the MCU. But uh, with She-Hulk Attorney of Law, a lot of um, events and moments from uh, The Incredible Hulk are becoming more and more canon. They are always were canon, of course. Uh, but uh, it seems that... Um, Feige and the team are dipping a little bit more into uh, the history there. Of course, we know um, that uh, William Hurt uh, had appeared in uh, Civil War, Black Widow, and a few other, uh, Endgame, a few other Marvel films uh, as his character, Thunderbolt Ross. But that was really the only, of course, because, uh, you know, Edward Norton was recast as Mark Ruffalo. That's really the only connection we've yet to see Liv Tyler come back or the Doc Sampson character that was introduced or even uh, the leader character, Tim Blake Nelson, that was introduced. So all, I, I feel hopeful that now that we've, you know, really embraced Tim Roth and no reason not to, Abomination is an important character in the MCU and Tim Roth is an amazing actor. Um, I'm hoping that we can... Uh, you know, maybe see Tim Blake Nelson in the future. I'd love to see Liv Tyler come back as uh, Bet Betty Ross. So um, there'd be some really exciting things. But we did get to see Tim Roth in this episode a little bit more. Um, and what I really liked was the way the character and the actor have adapted to the tone of the series that they're now uh -huh. on. And I feel like we saw this a little bit last week with Mark Ruffalo in the first episode. It was a bit of a funnier Bruce than we've seen in some of the other uh, MCU movies. And, and certainly because of the series as a comedy, uh, Tim Roth has some really funny stuff in this episode. And I think all of us have seen up to episode four. So without giving anything away, Tim Roth has a lot of more good stuff to do. Uh, Wendy, what, what are your thoughts on, on the Tim Roth, Emil Blonsky return and, uh, and seeing him in the series? I think it gives the fans a lot of, well, just like, you know, excitement too, because it's, it's been a while since we've seen, see, seen Emil Blonsky in the MCU. So to bring the actor back, to bring the character uh, back into it through the show, uh, and I imagine, you know, we will have more opportunities to see Tim Roth, hopefully. Uh, but at the, I just got to say, like, at the end of the episode, you know, that like that, that button that they put on the end of she of Jennifer saying, yes, I will represent. And he is a changed man. And they put that little joke of like, you know, oh, it was a whole different person. Like, I thought that was pretty clever. Um, and to give us a little bit of that connective tissue of why we saw well not really why but you know when everybody saw uh, uh abomination and uh wong in shang chi um it's not really answered in episode two but we got to see a glimpse of it and now it's connecting because for the longest time i'm like are we not going to answer this um because you know it wasn't really talked about in doctor strange right i thought that they would and so I like that they connected it here because it makes sense. And then you follow up by, by Jennifer's, well, that sucked. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, without I was giving clever. anything away, all Shang-Chi Hulk abomination questions are answered in the first four episodes. Mm -hmm. And I was really glad about that because I hate it when they're just sort of loose ends hanging around. Yeah. And uh, so I was really glad that that all sort of ends up in some way connecting. 
Uh, mm -hmm. and, and that felt good. James, what were your thoughts on uh, Tim Roth's return? I, I really liked it. I really thought like he had a blast playing this sort of this like Zen version of, of Emil Blonsky, the guy who's found himself, centered himself, doesn't have to turn into the abomination if he doesn't want to, has seven pen pal wives <laughs> that he's got his, his, his love, his soulmates, his pen pal soulmates, which is just, just you know, a bit creepy and weird, but also hilarious and kind of <laughs> absolutely out of left field for the character as you see him in Incredible Hulk. But Incredible Hulk, he's mostly just a you know, tough dude who's brought in to hunt down the Hulk and, and he's given super serum stuff himself and everything like that. But yeah, I, I thought he was really good. I thought it let Tim Roth do what Tim Roth can do when he's let off the hook a little bit. He can be funny, mm -hmm. wacky, he can do all sorts of stuff. And I thought he and Tatiana Maslany played off each other really well. I thought they were really good. But then, you know, honestly, given my fandom of Tatiana Maslany, I think she could play off against the Stone Column and it would still be fun. <laughs> But sure. yeah, it's it's really good. And I like the fact the episode also gets into, you know, Jen's new job and everything like that. You know, the, the moving on of her sort of career a little bit, even though she's not necessarily, doesn't feel like it's for the right reasons because they want her to be She-Hulk all the time. And she's like, look at these, look at these, you know, old white dudes. They never had to deal with that in their life, you know, in their careers with this kind of stuff. So yeah, I think the whole episode really worked to kind of build on what the first one had established and really starts moving the story along too. It's, it was really good fun. I'm, I'm really, really enjoying She-Hulk, I have to admit. Yeah, me too. Uh, let me pose one last question to both of you. Um, so since we mentioned it, the ending of this episode uh, sort of ties back to what happened in Shang-Chi and Ooh. it's revealed uh, that uh, Emil and Wong were fighting in this uh, um, match. Uh, so my question is, does She-Hulk take place at the same time as Shang-Chi or is that old video that was just revealed at this moment in the timeline? Wendy? Oh, I literally was, was having an online discussion with somebody and the answer lies in Bruce's arm. Yes, I agree and that I the answer lies in Bruce's arm. Yes. And my brain is a little, it's so foggy right now that I literally cannot remember what I researched. <laughs> I over, think, over I the think, weekend. Well, but it's weird because the if, if we're going with Bruce's arm, then that oh. makes me think that the when he's with Jennifer and and has the accident in, in the beginning of the first episode, that is after the events of the end credit scene in Shang Chi. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, However, mm -hmm. it all that also takes place months ahead of the actual events of She Hulk because mm. they flash back for her origin story. Right. So I would be led to believe that this takes place further along in the timeline than Shang-Chi and that just that video um, had just been released at this uh, moment. Uh -huh, uh -huh. That makes sense. But if you're watching the ep episode two, you know, it, it, it leads you to believe that that it's happened at that at the moment. same time. Yeah. So maybe we still need to find out. I don't know. James, what are your thoughts on where this is yeah. in the MCU timeline? I, I can't say I've done a completely deep dive into it, but I do know I was listening to a, a spoiler special podcast by my Empire colleagues, I should say. And someone brought up the idea that if you look in the end of Shang-Chi and the post credit sequence where the Hulk appears, where, well, Bruce appears, you can see he has the little the little device on his arm apparently. And now I haven't gone back and I haven't gone back and freeze framed or anything like this. So don't take this as Bible yet, but apparently you can see that his little sort of whatever it is, whatever he calls it, his little device that stops him turning into the Hulk um, on his, on his arm in that scene. So maybe that does offer that sort of, I get the feeling like Shang-Chi takes place at that time. Then you've got the, the months, the, the time when he's training with Jen and talks about it because he's right. better. And then, and then she Hulk takes place, you know, a few months after that. So that would be my guess. Don't quote me on it. I'm no expert. I really don't know for sure. I don't have Wendy's great excuse of COVID. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, I think that's right. Yeah. <laughs> onto something there. I didn't realize that he had that mm -hmm. on in the end credit scene. So I, the end credit scene could either take place right before or right after the time. You're talking about the end credit scene in Shang-Chi. Right? Shang-Chi, yeah, where he and Captain he was off. He was Bruce again. Yeah. He was Bruce again. And, and he has James is saying is that he has the, 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 the device. that stops him turning into Hulk when he doesn't want to and everything like yeah. that, the little restricted device or whatever it is okay. he invented. Yeah. yeah. But that so makes that me think Shang-Chi 
yeah. Origin, She-Hulk into in that order, but I don't know how the timeline right. works out right. in terms of how long it is before that. And it makes so, yeah. me think that the video of Wong and him fighting was just revealed at this point in the timeline, but took mm -hmm. place yeah. probably months previous. Yeah. yeah. Maybe. Well, well hopefully it will all be revealed. <laughs> we'll see. I will say one thing. It did make me go back and watch Incredible Hulk again. It yes, I watched Incredible, Incredible Hulk, Hulk yesterday. Hulk. Oh. Yeah. I did yeah. too, and, James. You know, yeah. yeah. So it's actually, not... is, is, is it on Disney Plus? Uh, no, I watched it on HBO Max. It's That's one of the where very, I watched it. It's oh. one of the only MCU yep. movies that is not on. Yep. Yep. Disney Plus yet. Yeah, I and think because Universal that. has film rights with that. Yeah, Ooh, they sold it to HBO. And then they so. don't have the Spider Mans because yeah, of because of so many right. stuff and everything. Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, yeah, weird that you have to go to HBO Max to watch yeah. the Incredible Hulk. I, I guess they did it. Well, yeah, I mean, why isn't it on Peacock if it's Universal? But then they obviously did like a package deal with a load of movies for HBO, so that's there. So I'm assuming maybe once that deal and expires, believe, Disney might be like, hey. And I believe the Deadpool's are well. We know they are on Disney Plus now, but I believe they're yeah. also on Freebie. Uh, oh, really? I did not know. Oh, that. I, watched, oh I think, yeah, I think you can watch right. Logan watch like and Fantastic the Deadpool's on Freebie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And oh. you have to watch with commercials, so you're better yeah. off just changing. <laughs> you're better off changing the parental uh, thing on your yeah. Disney Plus oh, and then Disney just Plus, watching them yeah. there. <laughs> it is interesting where they all uh, end up. Well. Yeah. It's interesting where we end up at the end of this show. I uh, want to thank you all for tuning in and reminding you that we are just one of the shows the Hollywood Critics Association's YouTube channel has. So make sure you hit that subscribe button, like this video, and tune in to Pop Council every Monday at 11 a.m. Pacific time. Uh, James, we want to thank you for joining us today and letting everyone know. Uh, please let everyone know where they can uh, find you. Well, thank you, guys. It's been a pleasure as always. It's always wonderful to be on the show. Um, yeah, people, if they really want to find me, my my online ramblings, I'm at, uh, at Jam White on Twitter, at Jam White on Instagram. I also have a Substack, which is Jay Writes. If you search on Substack for Jay Writes, it's pop culture stuff, reviews, all sorts of stuff. And then, yeah, the uh, online uh, website, I as opposed to all those offline websites, but the website of Empire Magazine, which is empireonline.com. I'm often there doing new stories and bits and pieces and all sorts of good fun stuff. Yep. Awesome. Thanks, James. And Wendy, another great show. Let everyone know where they can find you. Thanks, you guys. Awesome time talking to you both. Uh, you can find me on all the socials at just my name, Wendy Lee Zaney, or on YouTube, the Movie Couple channel. Awesome. And I'm Jamie Philbrook. You can find me on Facebook at my name, uh, at Philbrock on Instagram or uh, Twitter. And uh, check out Movie Phone for your uh, news, your listings, showtimes, interviews, reviews, and so much more. Uh, thank you all for joining us. And we'll see you right back here next week on Pop Council. Until then, thanks for watching. Bye, folks. See ya.